Hello everyone, welcome to my engine install wrap up video. So far the engine is installed in the chassis and all the connections have been plumbed. In this video I'll modify the axles, install the battery, bleed the clutch and fill the coolant. The axles that are used in the swap have to be mixed and matched to fit in the MR2. The transmission isn't placed in a stock location so we have to use some axles that happen to have the same spline and length then break them apart and reassemble them to work with the swap. The three axles are from the front wheel and all-wheel drive RAV4. The documentation shows exactly which ones to get and how to assemble them. These can be salvaged from a junkyard or can be bought remanufactured. The important note, however, is that they are not aftermarket. Aftermarket axles tend to use different inner tulips that vary between the right and left side axles unlike OEM which keeps them the same. There may be some aftermarket brand that uses the same bearing style, but most don't, which doesn't let you mix and match them. The remanufactured axle set is not expensive, about $250 for all three. I was easily able to get them on Rock Auto. At this point, I'm labeling all of the individual sections of the axles, and I have to match four sections together, leaving two sections as scrap. After removing the boot clamp with a flat head and making sure not to tear the boot, I'm able to pull out the tulip from the housing. Sometimes it needs to be put on an angle and snugly pulled to separate. The tulip is only held in by a snap ring and may need a light tap with a hammer to remove. The grease in here can be easily reused so you don't have to buy any more of it. It is however very messy and extremely difficult to remove from your hands, let alone your clothes. That long axle that I took apart turned out to be aftermarket and didn't match with the other axle, so I had to return it and get an actual OEM one. But after buying a supposed remanufactured one, I got sent a used axle. Slightly infuriating, but for my purposes, as long as there was not wear on the inside, I would be okay with it. Something I noticed was that the grease was very runny. This type is hard to reuse so I just clean it off with a degreaser and slathered on the extra grease from the leftover axle pieces. To finish assembly, I'm using this axle boot clamp tool with a set of boot clamps. The tool and a set of 50 clamps was $30. These are very handy as metal zip ties if you have nothing to do with the extras. Another thing that I noticed was that the axle support bearing was completely worn out. This is something that must be replaced, as not doing so could result in damage to other components of the car. To remove the bearing, I first have to pry away this dust cover piece. It takes just a few pries from all around, then slides off. Then there is a snap ring on the outer edge of the bearing that would allow you to remove the bearing housing. This snap ring doesn't have holes, so it's easier to just use two flat heads. A few taps with a hammer and it comes out. Then there's one more snap ring on the inner edge that holds the bearing to the axle. At this point, you can get a shop to press out the old bearing and press in the new one. I believe it needs a 20 ton press, so it's not something most people can do themselves. ASIN has some good replacement bearings that come with a new housing. After getting the bearing pressed in place, the snap ring goes back on and the axles are now ready to install. It doesn't matter which side you start with. The longer right side one just slides into the transmission, while the left one has a C-clip and requires a really good push to install. I realized that I got the wrong axle carrier bracket and had to get a new one as there were no Scion TCs near me. This bearing bracket only came with the 2011-2016 manual TC, so it's the rarest part of this swap to find. The axle just has three bolts to hold it in place, and I use Loctite because why not? I made sure to droop the axle and slowly so that the boot didn't tear. The hub goes back on just like you disassembled it and with the axle nut getting torqued to around 160 foot pounds. The left side axle needs a good push to get it in. The C-clip on the end of the axle has a small opening in it. It is much easier to install the axle if the opening is pointing down. Adding a small amount of grease on the end can help it slide in. Now I can fill up the transmission fluid. I used Redline GL4 and you need 2.5 quarts of it. The fill plug at the top is easy to reach and should be tightened to about 35 foot-pounds when you are done with it. I also filled up my engine oil at this point. 
and it takes about four and a half quarts of zero w20 now the fun part mounting the battery the cross member has some very convenient threaded holes in the front right and bottom left corner i used a civic battery holder as my old one was torn apart but the spider battery holder should work i positioned the battery beforehand to make sure that it wasn't interfering with the intake manifold and then marked and cut out the holes now the x-frame doesn't have to be bent out of the way nearly as much as i have here the only reason it's like this was because I broke a bolt inside one of the holes and had to move the battery in another few inches. If you have a hard time moving the X frame out of the way, you can put a card jack on the cross member and forcefully bend the frame slightly. You can use the stock spider battery, but anything bigger might not fit behind the muffler. The starter wire just bolts onto the terminal with the chassis fuse box wire going to positive and the transmission wire going to negative. The transmission wire is reused and can be bolted to any hole in the transmission. Just make sure that it's clean and making good contact. I moved the chassis ground wire to a small thread that was on the X-frame, also making sure it was sanded clean. If you are going to reuse the muffler, you need a thicker heat shield so that the battery doesn't just melt. My heat shield was touching the battery, but because it was double layered, the other side barely even got warm. I installed this later. Next, I am bleeding the clutch. There are a few ways to do this, but the quickest and easiest way is to use an air pump. Any shop compressor or bike pump will do, as long as it's not hand operated of course. I just used a $20 bike pump and it worked fine. Mark came up with this idea and it works better than most other methods. The first thing you need to do is remove the small dust cover on the clutch fluid reservoir cap, and then remove the small floating plastic piece on the inside. This will give you a way to pump air inside the reservoir easily. What we're trying to do here is flush out the old clutch fluid that has air bubbles inside throughout the entire car by forcing in new dot 4 fluid. So the first thing to do is unscrew the 9mm bleeder cap on the transmission. Make sure you have a container to collect the old fluid underneath it as the clutch fluid is very corrosive. Then you want to fill the reservoir almost all the way to the top with the new fluid, ignoring the fill line. Then install the rubber cap and compress the fluid down using the pump on that small opening. If you compress it too fast, the cap may pop off, but that's fine. You want to push the new fluid down through the lines, but make sure that the reservoir never gets empty. If it does, air bubbles might get in and you'll have to start over. I filled up the reservoir to the top and pushed it down again three more times. After filling it for the last time, you want to close off the bleeder, step inside the car, and manually pump the clutch pedal several times. The first time you do this, you will notice that there is no springiness to it as then you'll need to push it in and pull it back out with your hand. Make sure that the reservoir does not get empty while you pump the clutch pedal. You can push it in and out maybe 15 times before repeating the steps. Back to opening the bleeder, pushing in the fluid 4 or so times, closing it off and pumping the pedal. After about the third time of repeating this, I noticed that the pedal went from staying in place wherever it was to actually feeling like a clutch pedal. You now need to pump it with your foot. After a few more times, the pedal should feel just right if there are no air bubbles inside. The plastic piece can be returned and the dust cover can be put back on. The bleeder cap is just hand tightened with a small wrench. If you have spilled any fluid onto your paint, please wipe it off quickly and properly as it will eat through it. This whole process took me about, this whole process took me about 15 minutes to complete. The last thing to fill is the coolant. This is known to be difficult on the MR2 as the radiators in the front with the coolant hoses running underneath the car, leaving many places where air bubbles can be stuck. It may be possible to fill up the coolant without a vacuum bleeder, but good luck. The only way that reliably works is the vacuum bleeder method. I got this bleeder kit online for $40. It's very worth the money considering that you can also test any coolant system on any car for leaks using it. Don't mistake this with the hand-operated brake bleeder kit, as that won't work here. The way this bleeder works is that you get a shop compressor, preferably over 2 gallon capacity, and hook it up to the Venturi. This piece has one end that goes snugly into the coolant reservoir, and another that lets the air out. A Venturi works by letting high velocity air pass through a very narrow opening, before expanding back out to a larger diameter, this region creates very low pressure and in turn pulls a vacuum throughout the entire coolant system. The small knob on the connection allows me to seal off the vacuum while I recharge the compressor. 
The venturial relies on the initial burst of high pressure air and not so much the air that falls after. So you have to be quick in unscrewing the knob right after you release the air pressure. This dial shows me the vacuum pressure inside. You want to get to about 23 inches of mercury and have it held there for a while so that you know you have a good coolant system. The first time I did this, I noticed a few spots with a leak. The first one was the pressure release hole on the side of the reservoir which is needed so that your coolant system doesn't just explode. I temporarily plugged this so that I can pull the vacuum. I still had another one after that, but it wasn't so obvious. So I plugged the venturi from one end and let the air hose compress the coolant system with just a few psi instead. Then I used soap water to see where the leaking bubbles formed and sure enough, they formed right on the connection inside the reservoir. This knob expands the rubber to seal the hole and needs extra force to fill into the threads which it wasn't really designed to do. After that, I was able to pull a vacuum up to 21 inches with about five recharges. I wasn't able to pull more vacuum as the explosive release of air just didn't last long enough to pull any more air out, even at more than 100 PSI. Now that I have a nice vacuum that isn't leaking, I took out the hose and snapped in the clear tube, which will need to go into the coolant jug. After turning the release knob, the atmospheric pressure will allow coolant to smoothly enter the system through that tube and fill in all the collapsed hoses with coolant. The tube will keep on pulling fluid, so make sure that the jug doesn't get empty or it'll start pulling in air. I went through about one and a half gallons. I did end up with a very small air bubble, but it was easily removed by unscrewing the radiator cap found in the left corner of it. This was most likely because I didn't reach the entire 23 inches I was aiming for. After that, I would make sure to keep the car running for a while to know that the engine doesn't overheat. Now all that's left is the wiring. For a non-aftermarket ECU, you would already have everything done by now. But in my case with the Haltec, I need to wire in all the engine sensors and body controls, both of which came from the two main ECU plugs that I previously depinned. That's what I'll be focusing on in my next video, along with diagnosing some problems I came across. Then finally, I'll start up the car. Thanks for watching.